All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get rolling here. Thanks for coming out. I'm only 17 of 16. So again, thanks for really I very much appreciate people coming out and listening to the uh, uh, lectures. The, a lot of them. That was a lot. Next year we're going to do less. Uh, I don't know what. I don't know what it will be, but it will be fewer. Uh, fewer is more better. Uh, but. Anyway, but I do, it was a big experiment, and I think I'm very pleased. It's a great facility and a great, lovely place to be. So th thanks, for, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, so we've been doing this tour through the history of philosophy, and since we got an extra 17th, I thought, well, the history of the history is the present, right? So we just work to now. And so if you think about where we are now, we're in this interesting place, or at least I think we're in this interesting place. Um, and what we've been talking about is this move between uh, ordered systems, which is where, again, a, a classical society is a society where people agree on what they're arguing about. So you have thousands of theological debates during uh, Catholic domination of Europe about the nature of Catholicism and God, but we knew what we were debating about. In the Roman Empire, you have all kinds of philosophy and speculation, but they, knew, they agreed on the ground rules. Uh, ancient Greece, ancient China, this is the difference between when Confucius worked to found his school, nobody agreed about anything. That's why there were so many schools. <clears throat> Once you get an, a general agreement on the Confucius tradition, then you move into a classical period. One of the things that sort of sets Chinese civilization apart is it's, you know, it's had periods of, of chaos and revolution and overthrow, but then it tends to quickly re return again to a classical period where the general parameters of your society are agreed upon. And over the last couple of thousand years, I think China has probably spent more time under a classical system of general agreement about what's going on than any other society. And, and, and for something that's been that old and been going continuously for so long, it's an amazing achievement. So after the ism, so return to the isms. Remember I talked about this. So, so once you start, you know, nihilism, which says you don't believe in anything, again, hard to sustain, um, and all the other isms that tried to step in, socialism, communism, uh, Marxism, fascism, right? The, the big two that come out of this are national socialism and communism. Uh, by the end of World War II, neither looks very appealing, right, as an alternative. And it's hard for us to remember because when you stand on the other side of World War II, you go clearly Stalinist Russia and uh, Hitler's Germany are bad. There's no debate about this. But if you back up to like 1934, Many serious, reflective, intelligent, informed people said, here's the question. Are you going to pick communism or fascism? Because we know this lousy, fair, democratic crap has no chance of surviving. So it's pick a team. And which team do you think is going to win? Who's the better team? And that was really a big part of the outlook <clears throat> leading up to World War I, because it seemed clear the Western democracies were doomed. This is one reason France collapsed so quickly at the beginning of World War II. They fought vigorously for 12 minutes um, and, then, and then pitched it in. It's because basically French society was split into three parts. One part wanted the Soviet-style government. They were very hardcore Marxists, and they were for the Stalinist program. They didn't know it was the Stalinist program, right? So this is important that yet. It wasn't clear yet. Uh, another percentage really thought the Germans had worked it out. This National Socialism thing looked pretty good to them. Um, and then another third, which was sort of the social democratic middle, didn't know what the hell to do when you're faced with these two extreme groups and couldn't get themselves very well organized. So then World War II rolls around, and both those systems turn out to be A, not very appealing, let us say, uh, and B, not successful. Most importantly, so Nazi Germany gets destroyed. Soviet Russia does okay out of the war, but is so viciously damaged and so clearly oppressive that at least intellectually and culturally, people start looking at the alternative and going, wow, the post-war world, we think America looks more appealing than Russia. That's generally the conclusion. 
And so this is where you get the sort of what they call the American century for people who don't realize that centuries last a hundred years. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is it is that kind of concept because it lasted for a good furious you know forty years. But for those forty years, you get this system that says democracy, sort of quasi-liberal economics, and free trade, that is the way you want to run a government. And you get this idea that the purpose is the American dream, and the American dream is for people to get wealthy. Hello, Malcolm. Malcolm the dog is here to visit us. <laughs> that our, our goal is to become wealthier than we are. And for a while, this worked as a dream. Right? In, in the post-war world, this seemed okay. Better than communism, better than fascism, better than fighting a war. Okay. Improving your standard of living. That's not a terrible idea, by the way. And slowly this evolved into roughly the cultural consensus, certainly in the Western world, but actually through much of the world. Even if they didn't agree with it, they disagreed with it, people felt they had to argue against this. Argue against the American dream. Um, and it just gained momentum and took over until it just seemed natural and normal. What are we trying to do? We're trying to improve our standard of living. How do you know your country is doing well? Your GDP is growing. What is it that people should want? Low unemployment and high wages. If you have those things, all problems are solved. This was the idea. And it sort of reached its sort of perfection uh, in the notion that really all that matters is money. And that's why I, I love this quote from, it was uh, from the movie Wall Street, which I haven't seen, but it's a great quote. Um, and he says, I am not a destroyer of companies, I'm a liberator of them. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right, greed works, greed clarifies, cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms, greed for life, greed for money, greed for love, greed for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind and greed, you mark my words, will not only save Tedler paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the United States of America. Thank you. This, this sums it up. Greed. If you're trying to make yourself rich, not only is this good for you, it's good for everybody else. This, was, this became sort of an unquestioned cultural consensus. And it's not that people didn't go, wait, this seems limited or troubling, but generally as people behaved, it just seemed fine. No one quite, this is what we're here to do. There's no problem. But, you know, if you're trying to get wealthy, that's just smart. And we had sort of a vague cultural consensus that this is kind of where we want to make, plant our flag. Um, but roughly about the time that story and that, that uh, movie is coming out, uh, that system is falling apart, um, which is where, of course, we are now. Uh, people started to notice a few things, like, wow, even though the GDP of the country is growing, poverty is not declining. It's one of the strange historical facts of the United States is poverty has not declined in the United States in the last 50-ish years. It hasn't gone up, but it hasn't gone down. So two generations, two and a half generations, poverty, boop, flatline. Which is strange because the GDP has grown massively. So people started to know, wow, GDP growth doesn't seem to solve, for instance, this bottom percentage of poverty. Whatever the problem is, GDP growth doesn't address it. And so these sorts of issues are starting to roll around in people's minds, coming to increasingly to people's sort of cognition. And then you have the economic meltdown, which if people weren't a bit curious and worried before, it became quite obvious that the system may not be running quite as smoothly as we thought. Uh, and so people started going, hey, wait a second, my standard of living isn't rising. In fact, it might be falling. Things that we used to take for granted, we can no longer take for granted. The, the way the system works has changed dramatically. Um, and so it's not that there were new flaws in the system, is that people started to feel and recognize and respond to them differently. The, the notion of the American dream just sort of broke. The, if you want to call it the social contract, well, uh, uh, fell apart. Um, and for the example like is, 
people complain, they always say, oh, young people these days, millennials or whatever, Gen, Gen Y, Gen Z, you know, these, I'm not a big believer in these generational things. Generations exist, but it's very, you know, rough. Uh, but they don't want to work hard. They won't commit to a place that they're working in. And it's like, ah, think about what they lived through. They found out that anybody can be fired at any time. That no one is safe from being fired. Because if you've lived through the economic crisis, you looked around and said, oh, those people always have a, oh, they just got fired. Oh, those people have been there for 20 years working, at, oh, they just got fired. Those people just lost their house. They're doing everything right, working hard. Going, why, why would you believe? Why would you believe in a system that says, if you work hard every day and come to work and dedicate your life, then you'll get this reward down the line when they saw lots and lots, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of million people have their reward pulled away from them. The implicit, of course, this is never an explicit promise. It's not like a legal promise. But social contracts generally aren't legal promises. They're social promises. <laughs> Work hard, you'll be rewarded unless you're not. Right? That's sort of the message. And so, and so young people, not incorrectly, I would say, have started saying, well, wait a second. What are the conditions under which I work? Because I know at any moment I might have to stop working. You might fire me. I might become redundant. You'll move the factory overseas. Something will happen. And so that sort of vague social consensus, which was always vexed and fraught and debated about anyway, I don't want to say it, was, it became classical in any sense, never paid off. And one of the most stunning things I, I think that, that sort of signals the end of that completely um, was, I don't know if people know that Amazon was going to put a headquarters in New York or New Jersey or Brooklyn or something. Queens. Yeah, Queens, Queens, that's it, Queens, thank you. So what's a, remarkable here is the governor was for it and the mayor was for it. All the local officials were for it. They're like, this is the greatest thing ever. We've landed the coup. And then the people are like, hey, wait a second, we have a lot of questions. If you're from an older generation, you know jobs are good, high paying jobs are better. As a politician, the biggest win you can get is some big factory, some big company to come into your city, town, neighborhood and build something because that means jobs. Now, this has always been a dubious proposition, by the way. Ask Detroit. Detroit ran the experiment in this. Um, you know, but but it's, it's, it's been the belief. It's been the consensus. No one generally said, no, we don't want your employees. We don't want your high paying jobs. Ah, and then they did. Actually, they didn't say that. They said, we want to know a whole bunch of things about this. What effects is it going to have on housing prices? Who's going to get the jobs? What's going to happen to our transportation infrastructure? How will it affect our schools? And Amazon said, we don't answer those questions. And they just quit. They were unwilling to explore those questions, which shows that Amazon is being run by somebody from a previous generation. They say he's very foresightful, and in many ways, I'm sure he is. But in that attitude, completely out of step with the times. That's the old version. Oh, you don't want my factory? I'll go someplace that does. Ah, well, eventually you may discover you don't find a lot of those places. It's, it's the, the, the tenor is changing. I always say all good examples come from the National Football League, because uh, I love the National Football League. Uh, and this happened, is happening now in the NFL. For years and years and years, the NFL, which is a multi-billion dollar series of corporations, has been getting local civic entities, cities, counties, states, to pay for their stadiums, which is crazy. So a bunch of billionaire owners get citizens to pay taxes to build them stadiums that are used you know, eight times a year. I mean, good on them, right? That's what lobbying and lawyers and all that stuff are for, I guess. But it seems crazy, right? Why would you give money to billionaires? It makes no sense. But it did for the longest time. Ah, and then cities have started to catch on. The voters are going, uh, no. You want a stadium? Feel free to build it. Knock yourself. You're a private company. Do your private company thing. Build something. Ha, huh, there you go. And so the Chargers, who were in San Diego, the city said no, 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 no. And then they moved. Now, now San Diego Chargers have no home. They're sort of, they're squatting in LA at the moment in a soccer stadium. And, 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 this, and, and, the, and the league is trying to figure out where to move them, which is to say they're trying to find a city that will cough up 500 million to a billion dollars to give them a free stadium. And so far, no luck. Now they might find a sucker, or they might not, but that's a huge change. 
It's, 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 it's the attitudes are shifting around this. Um, and so this raises the question, do we have a possible new value system? And what we've basically lived through, everybody who's alive now, is a period again of what's called decadence, when we don't agree so much on what we're arguing about. Unless you bought into the whole wealth is great thing, which socially we sort of did, but it was always sort of vexed, we've never had a big cohesive structure. And in any case, the world never bought this. Parts of the world did, but many parts of the world did not. And so there was never a global consensus about this. And people who live in decadent ages tend to think that all ages will always be decadent, just as people who live in classical ages tend to think that all ages will be classical. Right? We've got it solved, we've got it organized, this is the way it goes, until it doesn't. Right? And then they think, oh, well, we're never going to get our shit together, it's always going to be confused and vexed until it's not. Right? Um, and tonight I would like to propose, simply because it's the 17th lecture, and it sort of doesn't count, that uh, there is a possibility that the whole global warming environmental thing may provide us with a classical foundation for a new way to organize and think about society and ourselves, which is what really matters. Right? Because in a world that's globally interconnected, nationalism, for instance, doesn't work. One reason you have so many nationalist movements, I often call them populist movements, but they should be distinguished, many of them are nationalist movements, is because when your values start to fall apart, where do you look? You look back. Oh, when did we used to be great? England is doing Brexit. Hey, we want to be independent England again. And I think sort of they must imagine that they're going to go back to when they were like a dominant empire. <laughs> or do they think they're going to go back to when they're a third-rate power off the coast of France? You know, I, I can't imagine they think the latter, which is historically much more accurate for most of English history. Um, but they must think that it's going to be great if they're a national again, which is, it just doesn't look that way. I mean, if you looked at it sort of by the numbers, they're just going to be sort of like Morocco, which is nothing wrong with Morocco, but it doesn't seem to be what they're shooting for. They want to be sort of global presence on the stage, and it's not going to happen uh, because the economy is small, population is small, and they're a stupid little island. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's as if Cuba suddenly decided they wanted to dominate the Pacific Ocean. You're like, do you realize you're not in the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> I would put my money on China, you know, if it's a race. Uh, you know, that, it, it's weird, but it, it, but it is just backwards looking. When, we, when did things be, used to be coherent? When did we know what our values were? When we were a nation. Part of this is, of course, totally illusory, but that's okay. It's a narrative you can hang on to. Um, but if you look forward to a different set of values, the great thing about globalism and global warming is it's messing up the whole globe, which means any response has to be unified, which means that it necessitates having a coherent set of global values, which has never happened in history. This would be totally new. Um, and, and, and interesting and exciting. But the idea is if, if we decide to really embrace this, which we may or we may not, it'll be interesting, but if we did speculatively, what it would mean is that every decision, all our values would become rated against how does this affect the globe? How does this affect the environment? Now notice this does not stop arguments. That's, that's what people often misunderstand about classical age. They're happy to argue. In the example, I give two quotes here. Um, if we look on the back, uh, grazing offers a bounty of benefits, increased diversity of plant and animal species, control of invasive plant species, such as yellow thistle, habitat restoration for threatened and endangered species, controlling er erosion from water runoff or improved water quality, blah, blah, blah. It's this whole list of all the things that the open grazing of animals provides the environment. Now, there's a big argument for this because like millions of buffalo used to roam. The environment of, of the Midwest and the Plain States was, was by buffaloes, big, huge grazing animals. And when they were all killed, it messed up the environment, something fierce. And so grazing animals could be a benefit to the environment. Or if we really want to reduce the human impact on the environment, the simplest and cheapest thing anyone can do is eat less meat. Oh, crap. 
Behind most of the joints of beef or chicken on our planet is a phenomenally wasteful land and energy-hungry system of farming that devastates forests, pollutes oceans, rivers, seas, and airs, depends on oil and coal, and is significantly responsible for climate change. So, should we eat animals? Should we not eat animals? The argument here, it's not how that gets resolved, probably won't be resolved. It's that if we agree that the metric is what's best for the planet, then we're in a classical age. If somebody says you shouldn't eat meat because it's not good for your health, see, then that's a whole different argument, right? We're not using the planet as a metric. But if you go, oh, yeah, you should because the way animals are grazed really helps certain environments, and if we do it correctly there, then eating meat increases biodiversity, maintains heart, all these good things for the environment. And once all of your decisions start being made or referenced through that, ah, now we have a shared set of values. Now you're looking at the world fundamentally in a way that millions or billions of people are also looking at the world. It has the potential, again, for the first time ever to produce a global consensus on values so that no matter where you are in the world, no matter what civilization, language, history, social orientation you're, you're, you're familiar with, you might have a core set of responses and interests that you share with the other seven billion people. This, this would be absolutely astonishing, unprecedented. I was trying to think of the largest cultural value consensus um, by population, it's probably China and India, but more China. By span, it's probably the Roman Empire, which goes back away, because they, they controlled a whole lot of the planet for a, for a good run of time. And they built sort of a, a, a consensus, at least a consensus among the elites. Um, and, and that sort of mass, but it would be, that is as nothing. Neither of these have any... Like, uh, uh, I mean, they're just not even comparable to the span of something like if we reach a consensus on some sort of environmental policies and stuff concerning global warming. And, and this is what happens when you change your values, when you go through all these philosophical changes we've been talking about. It's not that, oh, something out there changes. It's that when you go to the grocery store, you, you, everything around you, all the signals, all the signs, all the language becomes oh, this is a carbon neutral product. This is, this is regenerative agriculture. This plants trees. I think I mentioned before, there's, a, there's a, an app you can get in China to play this game, and when you score so many points, the people who make the app plant a tree. And it's so popular in China that they've planted, I forget, hundreds of millions of trees. They're reforesting China with an app. Because people love to play it, they get all these points, they plant a tree. And of course they make videos of them planting trees and then you know, all the trees are getting... And so it's like, wow. Even, even the games you play can begin to reflect this notion of, oh. And notice, you can think the game makers, they're making money on this. They're like, oh, that's genius, right? We figured out how to explain. But that's what common values are. When the Chinese, what Chinese, no. When the Catholic Church started selling indulgences, the reason you could sell indulgences is because people believed they worked. My uncle was a terrible guy, but I kind of liked him, and I hate to think about him suffering in purgatory. So if I give the Catholic Church a dollar, or the equivalent of it, they'll get him out six months early. All right, here's a dollar. <laughs> <clears throat> See, that's great. Right? But it only works and you have lots and lots of people who believe it works and care about the greater structure. If a lot of people think planting trees is good for the planet, which it pretty much is, um, then giving them a game to play that allows them to participate in planting trees works. 20 years ago in China, that game would not work. I mean, you didn't have the technology, but if you have the technology, it, it just, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, function. People would go, oh, well, that's sort of stupid, because we don't care about trees. Ah, we care about trees. All of a sudden, we really, really start caring about trees. 
And so from the level of the food you eat, the, the games you play, how you dress, what clothes you wear, you know, recycling, all of a sudden everything starts getting held up against this common yardstick about which you argue. And so it brings a sort of cultural, intellectual, philosophical uh, cohesiveness that we're completely unfamiliar with. Um, it, it's, it's one of those striking sort of features We'll know in about, oh, 20 years. It takes a while, right? So it's not going to be overnight. Uh, but you know, we'll start to see increasing signs if this actually starts to function this way. And it might. I don't know if it will. But it, it's the first thing I've seen that really has a global chance. Right? They go, oh, that really is a global philosophical notion. Um, but it has all these strangenesses to it. Um, what, one of the schools of environmental philosophy has a sort of Gaia hypothesis, as they call it. People, have people heard the Gaia hypothesis sort of vaguely? Uh, and that's the notion that the, the Earth is a single living organism and should be treated as such. And meow wah you are. You know, it's, it's, it's very softish on the science and very long on, on weirdly medieval theology. It, it has a sort of return of the totalizing being, right? So we understand ourselves as just a part of a larger living, breathing organism, Gaia, which is self-maintaining and self-organizing and all this. Um, and you know, there's a lot of merit there, I guess, but the problem is, is a planet does not care about us. So what, what the, the problem with the planet is it just doesn't it care. The universe, you know, an asteroid right now could be hurtling towards the Earth to destroy all life. And the planet is not like, oh, hey, guys, watch out. And it's like, no, and then you die. Uh, historically speaking, there's been times when the planet's been a solid block of ice, snowball Earth. Uh, we wouldn't enjoy that. There's also been a lot more time when there's been, you know, basically the whole Earth has been, we call it greenhouse Earth, has been really warm everywhere. That probably wouldn't be too good for us either. We, we, we wouldn't like that. But the planet didn't care. The planet was like, oh, we're killing off the ferns. No, it didn't care about the ferns. It doesn't care about anything. And so what happens is this notion of, oh, a single living organism, okay. But it tends to creep over this notion of thinking, living, caring being. Ooh, not so okay, right? And if you don't believe it, just look at floods, right? Floods kill people. They don't care, right? They just are sort of indifferent. That's the problem and beauty of nature. It just has no interest in us. We, we're interested in us, right? So people keep saying we're destroying the planet. Not really. A, we're just on the surface of the planet. Even when we dig, we don't dig very deep. There's a lot of planet. Right? And most of it we have nothing to do with, like 99.9%. .9%. We screw up a little bit of the surface, it's mostly really bad for us. And then they go, oh, but you're killing the polar bears. And I think it is sad to kill the polar bears, but who cares about the... the no, the seals are like, yes, kill those frickin' polar bears. <laughs> I tell you what we want, we want dead polar bears. So the seal lobby is overjoyed. <laughs> Um, but the polar bear is not so happy. But no, it's us. We care about the polar bears, or at least we think we care about the polar bears. I think we should care about the polar bears, but it's sort of an aesthetic issue. And this, this throws people off. This is what this philosophy of aesthetics is all about. It says not what should be or what's right. It says, well, how do you want things to be? Don't you want to live in a beautiful, pleasant, wonderful world? Right, so throughout gross domestic product, we now realize this doesn't work. And, you know, gross wonderful product. <laughs> right? And we're going to have, you know, Oscar Wilde be our minister of trade. <laughs> and things are going to be fabulous. Right? How fabulous is everything? That's your measure. Uh, and it seems crazy, but it's coming. They're going to start coming up with metrics for how to measure your environmental health. And then we'll start going, oh, we should improve it. And it'll be just like the GDP. And people will go, oh, our environmental health went up by two points. Yay. Just like people used to do a GDP, or our GDP went up by 0.2%. That's good. What does it mean? We have no idea. <laughs> it's like the stock market. The stock market is like a perfect example of this. I ask my students this all the time. I said, you know, Dow Jones Industrial Average, what is it? They don't know. Is it good if it goes up? Uh, yes, they say. Is it bad if it goes down? Yes. I'm like, why? They don't know. <laughs> what causes it to go up and down? They don't know. 
right? That's not perfect, right? Is the king good? Yes. Why? We don't know. <laughs> is it good if he's healthy? Yes. Why? We don't know. Is it bad if he dies? Yes. Bad. Why? We don't know. Right? We believe in like the Dow Jones Industrial Average just the way we used to believe in the kings. Because we know it has something to do with money. Money is something that's good. You want more money, not less money. So, okay, there you go. Um, but that's the nature of values and belief. And if you translate that, but what you believe in does matter. It's, it's, not, it's not a trivial thing. It really does have lots of knock-on effects. And so if all of a sudden you said, oh, we really do think we, you know, we should start, stop carbon, you know, try to reduce our carbon footprint. We could do all these things to just dramatically change uh, the way we do business and industry and our lives and reduce it. And we might. People, uh, people know the o ozone hole? This is one of those things. They said, you've got to stop putting the fluorocarbons into your hairspray. And people said, no, that'll destroy the economy. And they said, well, we're going to ban it anyway. And then it worked. Until it didn't. It turns out that people are still using it. But that, that, that notion that, but it wasn't, it didn't destroy the economy. We just switched to other things. And, and that notion that you, we, we can do that. And we've done it over, throughout history. This happened time and time again. Something like 70, 80, 90 percent of the population of, of any working area used to be slaves. And if you went to people and said, oh, well, let's get rid of slavery, they said, you can't. And then it turns out, no, you can. You can pretty much get rid of slavery. So that's cool, because we did, more or less. A little bit of slavery left. Uh, by the way, the distinct people say, oh, there's all these slaves in the world now. There are slaves in the world now, but it's illegal everywhere. So that's a huge change. And there's not, it, it, statistically speaking, it used to be about, today think of about, say, five billion people in the world um, being slaves. Right? That would be the statistical ratio of where the world used to be. This is, this is like, wow. It's, almost, it's just hard to conceptualize, right? That that, that that would even be possible. And so when we think about these changes, they have happened. They do happen. Women get to vote now. Think how insane that is, right? I mean, you look through, you think through world history that it's only been around for a, about a hundred years, which is unbelievable, right? Think about that for about a hundred years, um, and and you know that, and still rare throughout the world. They, they can't vote everywhere, even where there is voting, uh, women can't vote everywhere. So these fundamental changes are taking place. They do take place. But it seems like the globalization of the environmental ethos is one that might actually cause a sense of organization. One thing it does run counter to, by the way, and I'll flip over the page there. Um, and this is, this is from Ayn Rand. Uh, Poverty, ignorance, illness, and other problems of that kind are not metaphysical emergencies. By the metaphysical nature of man and of existence, man has to maintain his life by his own effort. The value he needs, such as wealth or knowledge, are not given to him automatically as a gift of nature, but have to be discovered and achieved by his own thinking and work. Um, part of the greed is good, yes. Is that Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand, yes, yes. Okay. So, so part, of the, part of the greed is good and the system that was functioning is the triumph of the individual. Um, and it certainly has been one of the major breakthroughs in intellectual history is this new emphasis on the individual. Uh, again, started in the Western world with the Renaissance and Confucianism, uh, you know, in China much earlier, but a sort of different notion of, of how you conceptualize the individual. But this was taken to the notion that, ah, people are unitary beings, right? And those man has to, um, uh, his own values he needs, such as wealth or knowledge, are not given to him automatically as a gift of nature, but have to be discovered and achieved by his own thinking and work. And we've sort of come to believe this even though even the slightest moment of reflection shows us to be silly in the extreme. Uh, for instance, if you speak a language, you did not create it. You are the inheritors of a linguistic tradition that carries incredible cultural, historical, intellectual forces and values in it. You do just inherit it. And language is one of the fundamental elements of making us human. And we have no, or almost no, unless you're Shakespeare, 
or you know someone like that, Confucius, for instance, who has a huge influence on their language, and that's usually after they're dead. So we inherit our language. We don't make it. We don't create it. It's given to us. And think of everything else we inherit. Roads, for instance. Roads are cool. I don't remember building them. <laughs> In fact, I don't believe I've ever built a road. And yet I drive on them all the time. How is that possible? Electrical infrastructure. I didn't put any of it in, thank goodness. Otherwise, the building would not pass code. Uh, you know, this is, this is, I didn't do it. I'm not generating that power. You're not generating the power. Um, this is one of those weird notions that has, goes along with greed is good. If you're an isolated individual on your own, then getting more for yourself makes sense. If you're not an isolated individual on your own, it doesn't make sense. And this is one of those things that is definitely shifting. People are starting to go, uh, no, this makes no sense. Which it doesn't, by the way. I mean, it's, like I said, it, does, it takes one second of reflection to go, oh, that's right. I haven't built anything in my world. I just showed up here and there it was. Why would I think I have to build everything and do it for myself? Because you can't, number one. And two, by the way, everybody knows if you raise it, a human being in isolation, they either die, called failure to thrive, they become sociopaths, an experiment run by Joseph Stalin and his happy bunch of people. Um, or they, for instance, you can't acquire language. You, you become a, sort of, it's essentially a type of brain damage. Your, your brain centers don't develop in a way that you can speak. You can't communicate like a human. Um, and so just being human requires you to be with other humans. It's a, it's a necessary component of our sur survival. But it runs counter to this notion of, oh, if I get more for me, I'm better off because I'm this monad that floats free in this universe of natural forces, which is just silly and wrong, um, as, we, as we all know, by the way. Rousseau had a very much better version of this, by the way, and he said the question is, how do you make the compromises between the individual and the social work well? That's the question, because he says it's inevitable that you're going to have to make these compromises. I can drive on the road, but I can't drive any way I want. It's the joke, right? I pay my taxes, I'll drive on any part of the road I want. No, you don't. You, you, you have to sort of play along with the other people, or else accidents happen. And that notion of going, oh, well, you know, I have to sort of conform, is a compromise on my individuality. But it's a compromise that has lots of benefits. For instance, I can drive around. If we disagree about this, you can no longer use roads. They cease to function. If everybody drives everywhere they want, they just freeze. And they don't work. So, you know, this sort of organization, rethinking the way we even imagine ourselves relative to the other people is a big change. It's a big change in our undergirding cultural values that you're already seeing, by the way. You look at some of the statistics, um, partly because of housing prices, but not just because of housing prices. They're saying more multi-generational houses are starting to exist, more co-housing, more people living together, more communal uh, housing and living situations are developing all over the country. And this is a complete reversal. Of, of what's happened. So if you go back to 1900, most people lived in multi-generational housing. If you go to 1960, most people did not live in multi-generational housing. If you go to today, we're starting to move back. Now that's very fast, culturally speaking. But it's not clear that people were unhappy or, or more unhappy when they lived with more people and more generations in a house than they are today. And that's what people are rethinking. Do I need one person for every 5,000 square foot house? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe if we have more people in the houses, it would be more fun, more enjoyable, more pleasant. It would up our fabulous rating, right? It would increase the, the what are fabulous GDP of our country. I had a friend, Pranav Jani, said this. He was from India, and he said, the thing that throws him off about America is you have all these big houses with nobody in them. In India, the point of having a big house is to fill it with people. That's the point of the big house, is the people. 
To have a big house and have no people in it is like, it's just, why have a big house? It just, he, he could not figure this out. And in some ways, those communal values, which are still very strong in India, um, sort of are, are creeping back in, in a different form. Uh, but are, are creeping back into the country because people are going, oh, wait a second, maybe it is nice to have people around. But that's a huge shift. And then people start going, oh, well, if we have more people living together, maybe it's more environmentally efficient. So maybe we're not just happier, but we can reduce our sort of carbon footprint or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, these two little changes in how we look at the world produce a completely different mode of living. I don't imagine someday I'm going to live in a big house with a big yard all on my own. I imagine I'm going to live someplace with a community of people who love me and I love them and we share the space and it's happy. It's a completely different life goal. Utterly and totally different. So, if, For instance, if you look at the Prudential commercials, get a piece of the rock. I love commercials. I never watch TV. If I do watch TV, I only watch the commercials. I love commercials because they speak so clearly to our beliefs and desires in our culture. They're just, that, that's what their whole job is. Um, and, and in fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine, Warren, who was making commercials recently. Hello, Warren. Um, and, and he said that in the commercial, the, the cinematographer kept trying to shoot people. And he's like, no, we don't sell people. You've got to focus on the stuff that the people want to sell, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, it's so telling. But Prudential, get a piece of the rock. And in the commercials, they almost invariably show old couple with grandchildren at what is clearly some huge vacation house. And the message is always the same thing. When you're old and have a huge vacation house, your grandkids are going to come for the weekend, and you're going to love it. And the rest of the time, you're just going to wander around, and I don't play racquetball in there or something. I don't know what you do in these big ass empty houses. It makes no sense. But, but this is the right. This is the image they show it over and over and over again. They don't show the big community that clearly lives together. They don't show that. They give you a sense of isolated splendor. We're removed from, we're out in the countryside. We're on the remote lake. We're at the seaside house with no one around. Because you don't want to be around people. We know that. People are bad. People ruin your life. You're an independent nomad. Floating free in the universe with no ties. Um, but again, I think that narrative is pretty much breaking down. I think it's starting to, to sort of dwindle. And if it will fail completely, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. But by the way, all kinds of things have to change, like building codes, right? The rules about how many people can live in any given place. Zoning. zoning, all the zoning laws, right? We don't zone to have people live communally, to have neighborhoods where everybody can share things. One of my favorite ideas is, is I guess it was happening in LA, and they, they really cracked down on it, is you had uh, older women in particular living on their own, and you had all these other people who were working and commuting. So they said, oh, I'll cook dinner for everybody. So when you get off work, you can just come to my house, because I live across the street from you, and you can eat dinner, and you don't have to worry about it. And we'll have this communal sort of family, but not officially family, but like a neighborhood dinner. And people loved this so much that the city had to step in and explain to them that this is illegal. <laughs> because you're not a commercial kitchen, right? So, so, so no, it's, it seems weird, but it's like, look, no, no, no. If you serve food to people and charge them for it, now you're a restaurant. And now you have to meet all the restaurant codes. What if my neighbors just come over and help me pay for the groceries? Ah, now you're confusing us. <laughs> Don't confuse us, right? And that's, but you, you know, that, you, you, ah. Right? You know, but, but just zoning, all these rules we live with that we don't think about, we're starting to think about. We're starting to really go, oh, wait a second. How can we reimagine this? And I said, to move back, I think one of the cores is how much of this is going against the environment? How much of this is going to be uh, used as a metric for whether or not it's a good idea? So a uh, uh, coffee shop I always go to, Velocity, best coffee shop on the planet. Um, the, uh, 
Joe, the owner, has switched to paper cups for water. And people have said, oh, but you're throwing away paper cups. And he says, ah, but paper is recyclable and biodegradable. Glasses only last for about 10 to 15 uses in a restaurant environment because they break and they chip, and then you can't use them, even really high quality ones. And so the environmental impact of using glass in a restaurant environment is very much higher than using paper cups. So now notice, and this seems not right. There's actually some analysis that says if you use a dishwasher, it's probably better to use paper plates and napkins because they use so much energy with the hot water and the motors and stuff, right, than it is to wash, but which, right, which sort of creeps us out, right? Uh, but, but these are the kinds of arguments and interesting experiments and, and, and values we're going to have to start examining. Or we're not our start, we are. We've already started this. The whole organic movement, which if you're older than I think 25 or 30, you can probably remember when organics was like, oh man, there's some smelly people over there <laughs> who think that not putting herbicides in your salad is wrong, right? And you're like, what are you talking about? Herbicides are great because they make your tastes so good, Paraquat, it's just got that, <laughs> you know? And then slowly, 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 now all of a sudden, every store, every market has to have organic, no matter how sad and neglected it looks in some of these places. They know they have to have it because the values are changing. They have to at least pretend like they're trying to care about organics because if you don't have it, people get pissed off. And then people started talking about how far your food is shipped. Again, carbon footprint, environmental impact. And it's all of a sudden local. The L started showing up on everything. It doesn't mean loser. It doesn't mean this food is loser. It means local. This is local. But I look at what they're saying is local, and I get dubious. Right? I'm like, what do you really mean by local? Because that is, you know, an Atlantic cod patty made locally. <laughs> and I think your definition of local and my definition of local might be different, right? One of these planets right here near the sun is one definition of local, right? Uh, but, you know, there's other ones that you could go with. But even, no matter how farcical and how easy it is to pick fun at them and assault them, even all the major corporations are starting to feel this pressure, like, oh, well, you know, people care. Which, again, is a complete and utter revolution in values from where we were 30, 40, 50 years ago, where people went the other way. You don't want local things. You want national things. Local bad, national good. Don't trust those local crazy people who don't know what they're doing. You want something from the big, shiny, gleaming factory. If you don't believe me, look at the commercials from the 50s and 60s. They're hilarious. Like I said, I love commercials. And they, this is precisely the point they made. You know, they'll take someone, show somebody with a chicken chopping the head off and the blood spurts and the feathers go, or you can get Tyson. And it's a clean environment, like, like it's a surgical room and the chickens are happy and, and they lay down and go to sleep and then they come out, you know, all clean and it's beautiful and like butterball. What kind do you want? Like, oh, I want those happy, surgical, clean chickens, not the one where the guy's smoking the cigarette and hitting it with a hammer. That's no good. Um, and so that's how you nationalize food production and you change people's values. And now we're going, oh, wait a second. The, the, again, the environmental questions, the animal rights questions, the organic questions, feeding to a new value system. And as we become more coherent in that, and as those are adopted by ever-increasing percentages of the population, it becomes the norm. It, it, it just becomes a standard conception of how things should be. And then if somebody says, oh no, this wasn't grown organically, then people go, we don't want to eat it. But by the way, this is why they're, they're, they're all, you have all these legal battles about labeling things genetically modified or not. Because all the research shows that if you tell people their food was genetically modified, they don't want it. They're like, well, I, I want something that hasn't been genetically modified. Now, whether the science of this backs this up or not, put that aside. 
it's clearly people just are like, hey, that sounds bad. I don't want to eat that. And, and, and as that attitude spreads, then that's what will be reflected in the culture and it'll be broadly adopted. And, and this is sort of how values change. And will they cohere? Now, this is the real question as we move forward. Will they cohere? One thing to recognize is people say, oh, why are all these climate denialists? Why do people resist this environmental stuff? Why? Ah, why? Because it's a huge change in values. When I was raised, literally raised on a farm, we used to kill weeds by spraying diesel on them. That is great. By the way, diesel is a fabulous weed killer. <laughs> diesel kills it dead, and it doesn't grow back. If you spray diesel along a fence line for a couple of months, whew, you don't get weeds for years. <laughs> Spectacular. Oh, yeah. Let's not talk about runoff. Let's not talk about environmental impact. Right? But that's just, I don't know, I was a kid. Go spray diesel or we hit you. Okay, I'll go spray diesel. I didn't know that's, that's how you made things go. We don't just spray diesel anymore, I think, I hope. Uh, let's go for not spraying diesel on everything. Um, but, but that, just in one lifetime, that'd just be unheard of now. People talk about, oh, Roundup is bad, which it is bad. But um, compared to diesel, I mean, Roundup is great compared to diesel, right? I mean, let's face it. Uh, uh, you know, that, so these sorts of um, developments are real and are sort of uh, uh, affecting all aspects of our lives. But for other people, they look at this and they go, wait, this challenges all the values and systems I was raised with. And they're right. I was told when I grew up, I want a big house. And I want it to have air conditioning in the garage. By the way, this exists in Arizona. People air condition their garage so their cars are cool when they get into them. <laughs> wow, that's great. Greenland says hello. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is what, but of course, I can afford it. I was told if I could afford it and I could pay for it, I should have it. It's not illegal. And now people are trying to tell me I'm wrong, that I shouldn't air condition my garage for some crazy reason, that I shouldn't put a golf course in the desert just because it's taking all the water from, say, the Colorado River. That's crazy. Um, and so it really is a challenge. And by the way, not necessarily even an articulated challenge. People know this. They go, oh, I don't exactly know why, but I know it's after some of my fundamental beliefs, and so I'm going to push back on that. I'm going to say it's not real, it's not happening, it's not really a danger, there's nothing we can do about it. Anything I can do so that I don't have to actually change the way I think, or I behave, or how I react to the world. And so that's how you know something is going on, by the way. It's not, these ideas are never adopted smoothly without struggle or, or difficult things. When people feel like they have to push back, that's when you know change is happening. If people don't feel like they have to fight back, there's no change going on. They're like, oh, this is fine, this is fine, this is not a problem, this is great. Like I said, this is why the Catholic Church was so happy to import the Greek and Roman classics. We're fine, it's all good, there's no problem, this is excellent. Those pagan... Greek thinkers were fine with Catholicism. I, I still can't figure out how they thought that, but they did, right? It was fine until it wasn't, and then it was too late. But then they're like, hey, wait a second, wait a second here. Um, so the, the final example here is for about 15 years, I would say, something like that, there was like Sesame Street, and there was a big push in children's program. They thought, oh, love the planet. Love the earth, trees, flowers, bushes, water. Fit. This is all great. And there are all these narratives and stories about how wonderful the environment is. How we, and all of a sudden, the kids got older. And they went to college. And they got environmental science degrees. And they're like, yeah, we got to change shit. <laughs> and now there's a big fight to take all that kind of curriculum out of the schools. Because they realize, oh, wait a second, the kids were paying attention. <laughs> Ho, 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 ho. No, 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 no. You guys got to calm down. It's all fine. Spray some diesel on it. Right? I mean, this is, this is right. This, this, it, it, that, that kind of, of, of right, they did, all of that, the values actually took hold. 
is, is becomes terrifying because it, it's it's perceived as a threat, and so you get the big cultural pushback. So when you see these cultural pushbacks, these big fights, uh, they seem crazy. Like why would anybody want to do this? Keep in mind, it, it's a sign not that nothing is happening and not that change isn't taking place. It's a sign that change is happening. And the forces of, of conservatism and backwards looking um, are trying to resist it furiously. That's how you know things are afoot. Um, and then if the change happens sufficiently, that it becomes, again, something like Confucianism in the Chinese culture, or Hinduism, uh, Brahminism really be more accurate in the Indian culture, then you get these classical periods where within this broad range of agreement all kinds of struggles and fights and disagreements happen, but they happen happily because we understand fundamentally when we communicate we have shared core values. And what we're trying to do is what's the best way to express them, which is a totally different world than the one in which I think we inhabit now which is we don't have the shared core values. We're, we're desperately looking for them uh, globally, not just nationally, by the way, but globally. That's why you see this globally, is because the entire planet is desperately looking around. And I, and I offer speculatively, by the way, because it's number 17 out of 16, that as you, as you watch the world, you think about intellectual trends and movements and philosophy, keep, keep a little part of your mind focused on what's going on with the environment and the global warming thing, because it may just be, maybe, uh, the intellectual structure that produces a new classical era. There you go, the globe. Thank you very much. And, 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 and really, thanks so much again for coming out, because I really appreciate it. 17 of you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. It was good. Thank you. Uh, and, and October October 15th, Tuesday, October 15th, Hegel. So I'm doing the other series, but it's, it's Tuesday, actually, because we had to change it. I'm sorry. This one is actually, they're always on the third Thursday, except for this one, because we had to change it. So Tuesday, October 15th, I'll, I'll be doing Hegel at the 